Welcome to the CSF review of the EULA 2020 first e-Congress. My name is Riki Alten from the Schlosspark Clinic in Charité in Berlin. And alongside with me today is my colleague, Peter Professor Thomas Dörner. With the first e-Congress now complete, I can say with confidence that this is certainly the most exciting and unique EULA Congress to date. Uh, whilst I'm sure everyone has missed meeting colleagues and friends face to face, I hope you all can find something and find some comfort and reassurance that we can still successfully share the newest knowledge and communicate with one another, even when we are apart. Thank you, Rike. I agree and I would like to thank everyone working behind the scenes who enabled EULA 2020 to work so well virtually. It's also for both of us, as well as a lot of other colleagues, a great experience. We will now review and discuss the most notable abstracts presented on EULA in, uh, during the EULA 2020 Virtual Congress related to cytokine signaling. So this year there were a number of interesting basic science sessions which included some outstanding standout presentations uh, in terms of basic science and cytokine signaling. Professor Ian McInnes presented an ex vivo comparison of paracetinib, tofacitinib, upadacitinib, frigotinib and cytokine signaling in human leuco leukocyte subpopulations. Uh, and this is uh, a very interesting, let's say, ex vivo or in vitro comparison uh, and using the different compounds which target different jack uh, molecules as you all know to a relative different uh, uh, extent but the jack inhibitors display different in vitro pharmacological profiles suggesting they modulate cytokine pathways to differing degrees and duration and here it was studied over 24 hours. To which extent this really applies to the, let's say, use in patients or in, in vivo needs to be further studied and demonstrated, but it gives at least a kind of flavor of, it, of the different potency and different profile of activity uh, in, uh, among the different jack inhibitors. Jack selectivity was also studied uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, in another uh, very interesting uh, submission to this year EULA by Gonzalez Travis uh, and they showed uh, in a cellular assay that there was that filgotinib had weaker potencies against JAK2, TIP2, JAK1, uh, JAK2 as well as JAK22 dependent pathways with the different cytokines as listed here and the downstream phosphorylated stat molecules. And they uh, allow the conclusion that filgotinib 200 milligram may have less impact on a subset of homeostatic immune functions via JAK2 and JAK3, at least, at least with, this, with this dosage, then observed uh, for the approved paracetinib, tofacitinib, and upadacitinib uh, molecules. Uh, another study by Frede and colleagues looked into the distant effects of the five JAK inhibitors in the modulation of human B cell activation. That is something that re is really very close to my heart. And uh, uh, B cells as well as T cells are also regulated by JAK, uh, and you can modulate uh, B cell survival, activation, maturation, apparently also by JAK inhibition. And there was a different differential outcome using the different inhibitors, hinting towards a distinct and unique effect on B cell homeostasis. And that's something what needs to be further addressed, not only in vitro, but also, also in, in vivo. And we are looking forward that the Freire's, Freire's study uh, takes off and looks into patients and confirms this uh, in vivo. Another study looked into a proteome, proteomic analysis comparing the different mode of action of upadacitinib compared to adalimumab in, in terms of immune pathway modulation in the phase three study and select compared 
And here, upadacitinib could be demonstrated with a modulatory effect, uh, very consistent with the broad cytokine inhibition, uh, which was highly uh, uh, compared to a TNF inhibitor like adalimumab and showed really a different mechanism of action or co and confirmed this uh, differently for upadacitinib versus adalimumab, uh, where upadacitinib in particular inhibited a broad profile of cytokines effective in neutrophils and macrophages. Um, which of the abstracts you presented were really that one you would go for further research? I know the answer already, but I want to hear it from you. Uh, I would, uh, if you allow me two picks, I would further look into the B cell study and the JAK inhibition. That's one thing, which where we know from uh, apparently by rituximab the, the, how effective this is, but maybe away from B cell depletion, maybe B cell modulation by a JAK inhibitor is a very promising uh, yes. approach that has not been largely investigated. And the other thing is, uh, let's, uh, as I was mentioning, look into the uh, Freire study, how this uh, behaves or validates the in vitro findings in, in vivo in patients. So let's now focus on the efficacy uh, data on baricitinib. And as you can see here, it demonstrated a maintenance of a clinical uh, relevant uh, outcome for up to three years, where the discontinuation rates indicated that paracetamol four milligram treatment was very well tolerated, which is quite uh, comparable to what we have seen during the development program, but goes now beyond the clinical development program into a three-year data. Another abstract presented at this year congress by Dr. Torikai uh, went into the uh, radiographic progression data of paracetinib over 48 weeks in the, uh, in the multi-center clinical uh, trial. They compared here the 2 milligram with the 4 milligram group, uh, 27 in the 2 milligram, 26 patients in the 4 milligram, and what they could demonstrate here, a favorable effect on the radiographic progression in the real world, quite comparable to what we have seen in the clinical uh, uh, development program, that suggested that even in the uh, real world, paracetamol is able to inhibit radiographic progression as, ha as has been demonstrated to the, during the reg registration trials. So Thomas, the long-term data look encouraging. Uh, what is about radiographic? Because it's also uh, very important for the institutions and for approval. So what's about uh, X-ray data? So the X-ray data for the 2 milligram, but especially also for the 4 milligram, confirmed on the one hand the inhibition of the radiographic progression as has been observed during the registration trials. But I think it's now also pretty much important that it has been demonstrated that the 4 milligram is more powerful and that this is also in the light of the lack of approval for the 4 milligram uh, in the US uh, where we have experiences with the 4 milligram, how good it is able to control the clinical signs and symptoms but it's now an additional confirmation from the radiographic progression that the 4 milligram has a substantial impact in the inhibition of this radiographic progression. Hopefully, that uh, will have um, that, that will help approval also for f four milligram in the US because they also need uh, this dosage there. Uh, I completely agree with you. Uh, and uh, what what is important, I think, in in our clinical practice, that we have the possibility for a step down as well as for a step up which is the great opportunity that is provided by the uh, current approval in our region for, uh, by paracetamol. But I think it's good to have a step down possibility. Uh, if you don't have a step down or, or step up possibility only with two milligram paracetamol, I think this uh, is not adequate for the impact of this uh, compound. There are several studies also looking on real world, and I'm personally always very much interested in real world data, um, especially 
actually because we have different populations uh, which are different from the trial populations. So for us in clinical practice, these uh, data of high value. I see real world data for baricitinib and now these data have been collected for 8.4 years. That's a very long time period. And what we can see from these data, especially the events of interest like DVD or infections, um, the safety profile was maintained to all the data we have seen before. There is no increase in the incident rates across all the important safety topics through this long-term exposure. And if we come to the next slide, we have a comparison um, between Bari, Citinib and Tofa. This is also interesting. And we can see that both compounds have really a comparable profile as well in efficacy, but also in safety under real world conditions. And if we come to the next slide, which shows very important data from the Swiss registry, this is one of my most favorable slides of the whole EULA, by the way. Uh, we can also see that the patients who were started on baricitinib were older, had a longer disease duration, had more treatment, prevent treatment failures than other biodemat patients. And also in this so-called more complicated population, baricitinib demonstrated a significantly higher drug maintenance than TNF inhibitors, while there were similar trends in all the other compounds measured. It's overall very reassuring. And uh, honestly, just to ask you one question, are we seeing anything in the real world data what we have not expected or what we have not seen during the clinical development uh, program, which was a very good collection of all the efficacy safety data? No, I haven't seen any surprising event which makes me nervous. Uh, all the data which were collected in the clinical trial program were confirmed by these real world data and we are still awaiting data, of course, of our German registry. Uh, but so far, I saw the data. They are all showing into the same direction. That's very interesting because if we take into account that only about 30% of our daily patients are eligible to go into clinical studies, mean, that means, on the other hand, we are collecting data of the majority of 70% of the additional RA patients, what we see in the real world data, and they somehow confirm with higher, in the higher risk population, what we have seen in the lower risk uh, clinical study population. That's what I've really also found re really reassuring is that the increase of pulmonary embolism and deep vein thrombosis is not substantially different to what we would expect from a general RA population. In, in this study with 0 0.27, 0 0.26 uh, events. We have always to take into account that there is already an increased risk in this population uh, when we go could compare to a normal population. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. It's already okay. twofold and, and this in the real world population did not further enhance. So this is no. quite reassuring. No. Yeah. The Philgotinib which has not been approved, um, but there are many trials around already. And so we can see also very interesting data here at EULA. First of all, the so-called Finch one. Um, so we can see here also the results for 52 weeks. And we have been seeing, also we participate in this trial that Phil showed sustained efficacy, improvements of course in all PIOs, and also, last but not least, in X-ray progression, was well tolerated, had a faster onset, and also a numerically greater, um, better result with 200 in comparison to 100 milligram. So this is also good and reassuring results for the population, which is our daily population, the inadequate metotrexate non-responders. So the next slide, please. In the next slide, we have another uh, population, the more difficult to treat population, the inadequate responders to biological DMARDs. And here we have seen by Walker, 
um, that also in patient reported outcome, especially in pain, fatigue, and also health related quality of life, um, we can take into account good patients who have problems concerning pain, especially quality of life and reduce um, really um, a lot of problems in this um, issue, especially fatigue is a big problem in many of these patients that we can also see that pilgotinib is a good option for these uh, patients. And despite the fact that they have had experience already with non-response to biological demands, there is another new option now uh, with the good results in the key pros, which are very much comparable to the other uh, YAK inhibitors we have seen so far. So the next uh, slide is addressing in the so-called FINCH-3 trial. Um, that the efficacy is also sustained for 52 weeks. It has a faster onset and a more sustained onset also for the 200 milligram dosage versus 100 milligram. With 200 milligram, just um, in comparison to the UPA data here, there were no new safety signals observed. And um, this is um, probably we will not get this indication approved firsthand. These are the metotrexate naive patients. But it's good to have these data and uh, really to be sure that also these data can uh, give us a uh, lot of good feelings if we do really prescribe it in the very early line. So the three FINCH trials we have seen and now uh, in rheumatoid arthritis, and now we can also see data <clears throat> in uh, psoriasis arthritis. First of all, the data prevented, presented by Halliwell, the so-called Equator trial, and also here the effects of filgotinib on the key efficacy endpoints were consistent across all the subgroups which were investigated, as well different patient groups, disease duration, and also specific treatment characteristics. This was a phase two trial, but we see also now uh, data presented by Daphna Gladman when we go to the next slide, um, where we have long-term data. Can you move please forward to the next slide? Here you can see the Equator 2 dial. It was an open long-term extension for 52 weeks. And you can see that in a subgroup of these patients, I think that's very interesting results that concerning ACR50, more than 90% of the patients achieved um, the response which were uh, reached in the randomized clinical trial from the long term and also 77 percent of the patient reached the so-called minimal disease activity which is a measure which is mostly used in the psa field not so much common so far for rheumatoid arthritis so what we can conclude from this presentation is that there is probably a further improvement in disease activity reduction which can be expected beyond the first 16 weeks. This is very important that we don't give up too early because I think the population of the PSA uh, patients are different from that what we see in rheumatoid arthritis. I'm, I'm still struggling with the question. We have now the newest drug inhibitor, Fulgotinib. What do we get in addition to, to in comparison to what we have already with upadacitinib, baracitinib, tofacitinib. I, I think one of the possibilities is that we have a higher, let's say, daily dosage, either, either 100 or 200 milligram, and, and, and maybe the, the patient tailoring uh, in terms of the molecular impact of 100 or 200, 200 milligram compared to 15 or 4 or 2 milligram gives us some additional opportunities to identify a better patient-tailored therapy? Yes, but I think um, the selectivity of the filgotinib might play a role concerning, for instance, anemia. So far, I overlook the data. The yeah. data for anemia are a little bit better than for the other yucks. Okay. And as we know, anemia closely relates to fatigue and other um, so-called contextual factors of our patients that might help a little bit to improve their general situation. 
And, and do we have some, some data in, uh, for the PSA patients? Uh, you may forgive me, but uh, maybe I have overlooked this. In, in terms of enthesitis, how impactful is uh, uh, Fugotinib in, in terms of enthesitis? So measured was the PASTAS, the yeah. low disease activity and the very low disease activity. I'm not aware whether they also did MARTHIS or other enthesitis scores. I don't know. To be on, to be honest, but it might give us if if it comes to the approval of Vigotinib for PSA, it might give us also the the opportunity to have a larger area of possibilities uh, yes. to, for the patients. So the next uh, four abstracts uh, deal with the biomarker abstracts uh, related to fulgotinib, uh, again coming back to, uh, back to the equator trial. Uh, and I think it's pretty much important also having a, a lot of different JAK inhibitors available to identify patients best who might have the best benefit uh, risk ratio for one or the other JAK inhibitor. And here one study by Daphna Gladman from Canada uh, showed that decreases in circulating pro-inflammatory cytokines and biomarkers of pathobiology and psoriatic uh, disease uh, suggest that filgotinib improves PSA at the molecular level. So this was and, and is expected, but I think the big question and the jury is still out, which is the most reli reliable and best biomarker to identify the patients who are responding on the clinical as well as on the molecular level. Another uh, biomarker study uh, in patients with uh, active rheumatoid arthritis studied changes in the Finch 3 study. And they found uh, that uh, the inhibition of the JAK stat signaling was uh, related to uh, changes of the SOX2 molecule as well as other RA disease activity associated genes, the FEM28 and the MET-L7B in patients who received a filgotinib versus placebo in combination with methotrexate. And I think uh, that is one of the early studies that identifies molecular responses, but I still think it needs further validation studies and even prospective validation studies. And with that, uh, we, we have another uh, an analysis from the Finch uh, 3 study uh, where uh, molecular molecules like increases of MMP7 and decreases of the GMCSF under Fugotinib 200 milligram showed greater decrease of track P5B and ICAM1 uh, under Fugotinib 200 milligram alone. These are additional candidates, and again, I come back uh, to my point, it needs further validation, prospective validation, but these are uh, I, so far identified uh, very promising molecules in order to patient uh, tailor success of therapy uh, in patients receiving filgotinib, and all these molecule, molecules are related to the mechanism of action as we would expect from a JAK1 uh, inhibitor. Um, I'm always interested in biomarkers, um, but uh, playing the advocate's devil, I would like to ask you the question, how useful are biomarkers for our daily clinical practice yet so far? So this is a great point and I, 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 I'm, I'm really very grateful that you raised this point because my personal view is uh, away from simply studying molecular changes which you can also expect in non-responders, in preclinical studies whatsoever, we need to come to a point to bring in, 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 in times where we have even the computational possibilities to combine clinical features with molecular features that we have a clinical molecular, let's say, characteristic profile of, a res of responders versus non-responders. And as long as we are not really connecting the dots between clinical characteristics and the molecular profile, we will not make any movement, I think. And, and this uh, is still lacking even in, in the newest abstracts, what we have seen. So far. That's it. It's interesting. 
and somehow it might be consistent with clinical efficacy what we can measure with our outcome measures um, but i think it's a long way to go still yeah to make it useful for daily practice yeah and what has been described and reported yes. here is changes under therapy what we urgently need is baseline characteristics clinical and molecular findings that give us a high likelihood uh, to predict clinical response. And, and this is still uh, missing, largely We missing. don't have it, it's still licking. You know? and, and we rely more on our clinical assessment than on a molecular assessment at right. baseline, unfortunately. And uh, in 80%, we are not doing so bad so far. Now, uh, providing you an overview on the three tofacitinib abstracts uh, presented at the 2020 EULA. Uh, the first abstract deals with the treatment of polyarticular uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, and this is from a phase three uh, RCT uh, in patients who uh, have an age between two and uh, almost close to 18 years. Uh, and in this population, tofacitinib resulted in significantly fewer disease flares and uh, time to improve disease activity, physical function compared to patients who received uh, placebo. And this was all the way to week 44. Another abstract uh, about tofacitinib deals with the residual pain in patients with psoriatic arthritis, which is a very important aspect in this disease because even in patients having no inflammatory activity, very often we have substantial pain. And in this study, it could be demonstrated uh, under tofacitinib versus adalimumab and placebo that in terms of pain at the readout or assessment at month three, tofacitinib showed uh, more improvement in terms of residual pain compared to the uh, control groups, uh, and which is apparently or obviously not attributable to inflammation. So this is very inter interesting, and it adds an additional aspect by tofacitinib to pain mechanisms that are apparently modulated under JAK inhibitors independent of the inflammatory activity, at least detectable inflammatory activity. Uh, another abstract uh, uh, demonstrated the effect of tofacitinib in the treatment of active MRI sacroiliitis and disease activity in patients with PSA uh, from clinical practice. This is presented by Dr. Guba at the EULA 2020. And what they could demonstrate that the JAK inhibition by tofacitinib shows high efficacy in, re in, in reducing active MRI sacroiliitis and decreasing activity of axial involvement in patients suffering from psoriatic uh, arthritis compared to the control arms. I think the MRI, MRI data are somehow revolutionary. It's very, very important that we have shown this for the first time with the YAK inhibitor. Um, and this will open up really a new future. We have participated also in the PSA study in the OPAL program. Um, but there, that was not a primary endpoint to look at. So this is a new aspect. And uh, I think it will be very interesting to uh, take this into focus more now uh, for our patients with PSA uh, treated uh, with tofacitinib. That's one yeah. point. I absolutely agree with you and I think it will hopefully generate a lot of interest in re-evaluating the MRI of sacroiliitis also in other JAK inhibitors, right? Yes, yes, because um, doing MRI in sacroiliitis in PSA is not standard of care. We don't do it, by the way, to be honest, in all patients with PSA. This is also, um, the SOP has to be rewritten because we don't look after this so far, not in all patients. Yeah. So that's very interesting, I think. And uh, there are two other aspects. As you know, I'm interested in patient reported outcome uh, 
and we have reanalyzed some data together with Vibeke and uh, also other colleagues um, concerning um, pain, residual pain, by patients who were treated with tofacitinib. And there is also something beyond which we don't know so far. I think that is really important that pain is not always totally 100% related to inflammation. There is a disconnect. And mm -hmm. this is also an important uh, contribution, uh, I think. And last but not least, I'm very happy that we have an option presented by Nicolo Ruperto uh, for our small patients with oral uh, compounds for juvenile arthritis. Yep. Uh, coming back to the pain, I think there are also, there are also additional studies with IL-6 receptor blockers looking into these issues. And, and maybe, we don't know whether this is exclusively related to IL-6 uh, efficacy, but there are some apparently modulation or modulators of pain perception related to IL-6 IL in the brain or in the peripheral nervous system. And that, that's also something where the uh, cytokine inhibition might even revolutionize uh, pain management independent from our disease. Of course. Can you uh, remember the Rucumab, which uh, were never licensed for uh, rheumatoid arthritis? We did a lot of studies with the Rucumab. Yeah. And some of the patients told us, are you giving me psychedelic drugs now? Because I feel so good. Yeah, exactly. And, and therefore, I think, I, I don't know whether this has been followed, but some of the IL-6 blockers uh, are also under investigation in uh, mm -hmm. neurology, psychiatry. Yes. Depression, etc. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So the following abstracts analyze the efficacy and safety of upadacitinib in various populations uh, suffering from rheumatoid arthritis. So one of the big questions was the sustainability of response between upadacitinib and patients receiving adalimumab. Uh, and what you can see here in terms of the CDI remission, CDI low disease activity, there was a significantly greater proportion of patients who were methotrexate inadequate responders who achieved clinical remission under upadacitinib in combination with methotrexate com compared to the combination of adalimumab in combination with methotrexate. So this is 41% versus 31% in the CDI remission, which I in particular find quite high in terms of the CDI remission where we usually see numbers between 20-25% otherwise. So the second uh, upadacitinib uh, uh, abstract deals with upadacitinib monotherapy in methotrexate naive patients with early active rheumatoid arthritis uh, within three months after the uh, diagnosis. This is part of the post hoc analysis of SELECT early. And as you can see here, in rheumatoid arthritis, the early initiation of upadacitinib monotherapy within three months after the diagnosis was clinically uh, uh, significantly superior compared to methotrexate, uh, patients receiving methotrexate. So this is not within the, let's say, approved indication of upadacitinib, but confirms that the early start of a JAK1 inhibitor like upadacitinib is superior to what uh, we see usually under methotrexate treatment. A third abstract deals with upadacitinib monotherapy in patients who are inadequate responders to methotrexate. And we are seeing here data from an 84-week trial from the SELECT MONO study. Uh, and interestingly enough, patients who switch from methotrexate to upadacitinib demonstrated comparable efficacy uh, 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 and re responded initially in this study with no safety, new safety si signals identified. And, and this is quite reassuring out of the selective mono monotherapy study. Uh, the other uh, abstract uh, dealing with select PSA1 deals with upadacitinib versus placebo and adalimumab in patients with active psoriatic arthritis and inadequate response to non-biologic disease-modifying disease modi anti-rheumatic therapy. This is a double-blind randomized controlled phase three trial. Uh, 
as you can see here, at week 12, the ACR20 rates were roughly 71% with upadacitinib 15 milligrams compared to 78.5 uh, with 30 milligram versus 65% under adalimumab. This reached really clear superiority for upadacitinib versus adalimumab. And the, the study also, in addition, investigated improved musculoskeletal improvements in psoriasis, physical function, pain and fatigue, including also the inhibition of radiographic progression. Uh, a further abstract, and the first author is uh, Ernest Choi, uh, deals with the incident and risk of venous thromboembolic events in patients with rheumatoid arthritis enrolled in the upadacitinib select clinical trial program. Interestingly enough, they found uh, incidence rates for VTEs of 0.5 up to down to 0.3 in this range, so between 0.3 to 0.5 for the upadacitinib 15 and 30 milligram group versus the adalimumab group in combination with methotrexate. So this was quite comparable and therefore the conclusion by this uh, by this abstract is that VTE event rates appear balanced across upadacitinib dosages uh, compared to the active comparator uh, as long as the risk factors identified uh, and have taken into consideration are prior VTEs and the BMI. This is a, an, again a very important consideration if we are starting JAK inhibitors in patients with rheumatoid arthritis and other diseases, prior history of VT, VTE and the BMI as very important additional risk factors in addition to the underlying risk of the, of the disease. So uh, the other very important area of interest is the occurrence of herpesosta under JAK inhibitors uh, and one of the JAK inhibitors as we are discussing here is upadacitinib in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. This has been studied in Kevin Wintrop's abstract here presented at the EULA and they found the occurrence of herpes zoster events under upadacitinib were, more, co were more, co more common in the 30 milligram versus 50 milligram group. This is an, an additional confirmation that there is apparently a dose response or dose adverse event rate effect. It was higher in both uh, upadacitinib groups compared to the adalimumab methotrexate combination and the methotrexate monotherapy. Uh, another study uh, addressed upadacitinib in, in comparison to abatacept in patients with active rheumatoid arthritis, uh, inadequately responding to or intolerant to other biologic disease modifying uh, drugs in the Select Choice study. Uh, this is part of a phase three trial program. And the conclusion was here in patients who don't, did not adequately respond to biological DMA therapy, suffering from rheumatoid arthritis, upadacitinib was clearly superior in terms of the improvement of signs and symptoms compared to abadacept with no new or additional, so far unknown, uh, additional changes of the risk profile. Um, I think on one hand that is interesting, but uh, on other hand, on the other hand, it's not fair. Why it is not fair? Because if you go to patients who have really not responded to so many biological drugs, we know that they have also a lot of complications responding to arbitracept. Arbitracept, due to its unique mechanism of action, is the most effective drug in very very early um, disease. So. I, I, I'm not uh, surprised by these results and they would not give me so much information for my clinical uh, daily practice uh, because I always use, if I use ABBA and I have many patients on ABBA as you know from the very beginning, very early in the disease court. If you have had already three or four other biological drugs, you don't have good responses. I absolutely agree. Maybe it's also not fair in terms, we need to have better stratification of our patients. Right. Uh, maybe the abatazep responders are a particular, let's say, entity of RA showing highly and favorable responses with good safety uh, to abatazep uh, 
versus an otherwise very refractory patient population, which on the other end responds, for example, to paracetamol. Yes. Yep. So that's uh, the most important thing to make a, a decision before. What I think is also interesting, what I saw from the last slide um, you showed by Wintrop, uh, that the higher dosage might be of risk concerning herpes zoster. Absolutely, absolutely. 30 milligrams. It, but, but this somehow is, is a confirmation of the clinical uh, trial program where we have also seen a dose response yes. more herpes zoster in the 30 milligram as compared right. to the 50 milligram. Now we come to the very interesting uh, safety aspects of JAK inhibitors. Rika, right? Yes, there has been also always a lot of noise about this point, and especially in the United States, they are more critical than here. In the next slide, we can see data on the very important question concerning the thromboembolic uh, risk uh, with the YAK inhibition. And here you can see data on the safety profile of tofacitinib and baricitinib in the WHO Vigibase. Um, there was an analysis from 2019, and this study supports more caution. Um, in those patients who have a high risk for thromboembolic events, um, especially as we really remember the data which we know, these were uh, patients who had already such an event, who had a high BMI, who were continuously on coccyps, for instance. These are things we are already taking into account, I think, if we consider uh, prescribing yucks for patients. The next point, and um, this is also important, of course, um, the SOSTA uh, risk for these patients. We know by now um, that there is a higher risk. Uh, and we are in the fortunate situation, for instance, in Germany, at least at, we can get the vaccination. We really try to vaccinate all our patients before we decide to put them on YAK inhibitors, but this might not be available in all countries. So the question which I would like uh, to put into this context is, as we know, that there is an in increased risk of opportunistic infections, especially concerning herpes zoster. Uh, it differs between 1 and 10 percent in the trials. Um, we have to be very cautious. And um, my answer uh, to uh, this abstract is try as much as you can give vaccination to your patients. Easiest prevention is vaccination. And, uh... I do hope that soon the shortages of this uh, Shingrix va vaccine uh, will be uh, resolved and we will have the opportunity to vaccinate all of our patients. Right. Th that, that's well, maybe the, uh, the biggest challenge right now in order to prevent the herpesoster issue. It's the only answer uh, which really rules out this risk. Yeah, and okay. the question is if if vaccinated patients are really 100% protected? I, no. <laughs> most likely not. This is my experience, okay? But at least at the very high rate, they are protected. Yeah. The following abstracts feature multiple JAK inhibitors in clinical settings. Uh, and uh, these are altogether four abstracts which I'm happy to share with you, the data. So the first uh, abstract addressed the steroid sparing impact of JAK inhibitors in a clinical real life setting. And uh, it's quite reassuring that uh, in addition to the rapid reduction of disease activity uh, induced by the JAK inhibitor, inhibitors, it also allowed a substantial reduction of the daily prednisolone usage. So a second abstract looked into the effect of JAK inhibition, inhibition on pain and quality of life in rheumatoid arthritis patients. And here they in particular focused on patients 51 under baricitinib and 32 under tofacitinib. And both JAK inhibitors having a slightly different, let's say, uh, uh, profile 
but both were able to induce a rapid improvement of disease activity, but at the same time also improvements in pain and sub partly also independent of the inflammatory activity. And this, as we discussed earlier, is a very interesting feature of the JAK inhibitors that they are apparently also modulators or in, able to improve uh, the pain perception. Another very interesting abstract uh, presented by Dr. Roterto Guerrero uh, at the EULA 2020 looked into the efficacy and safety of switching from one JAK inhibitor to another JAK inhibitor in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, as you can see here, the details are listed. The use of a second JAK inhibitor was safe and allowed the improvement in efficacy. So this is a good, uh, let's say, reflection what is coming into clinical practice, that switching from one JAK inhibitor to another JAK inhibitor can be done, uh, apparently safely and uh, allowing the improvement of efficacy. Another abstract looked into the discontinuation of baricitinib after uh, achieving low disease activity in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, again from a clinical practice setting in a multi-center observational study, again presented by Dr. Torikai. And it showed that uh, the discontinuation uh, under baricitinib without a flare, uh, reinitiation of baricitinib was able to reintroduce a low disease activity status in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. So even some times of discontinuation and then reinstalling paracetinib allowed a reinduction of low disease activity status. These data are nice to have, but nevertheless, uh, there are some data on baricitinib already by Takeuchi, I think, who yeah. showed this very nicely, uh, the reduction. But uh, as we are not happy with low disease activity, this is not really what we are aiming for. I think if you have a patient who is in remission, then the patient should be kept in remission. And you know, I'm, uh, some, I worked uh, some time on flare. I'm still very critical with flares. What is a flare? How was it measured? How was it defined, et cetera, et cetera. So you can do this if there is a need due to an intervention or whatsoever. But for me, it is not a strategy to do so. So there are a handful of predictor analysis I would like to highlight in the subsequent slides. The so-called jackpot study uh, analyzed the comparative effectiveness of JAK inhibitors versus TNF inhibitors, abatacept, Ab abatacept and the IL-6 receptor inhibitors in patients suffering from rheumatoid arthritis. This, this, uh, these are data from an international collaboration uh, study or registry data. And as you can see here, uh, the adjusted overall drug retention of JAK inhibitors tended to be higher than of TNF inhibitors uh, and the other compounds, but there were some variations between individual countries that might have also something to do with the nation, national healthcare systems and so on. But I would really encourage you to go into the details of this abstract because this is quite interesting, I think, because drug retention impacts our daily business, our daily practice, uh, when we need to switch from one compound to the other. And I think this is a very interesting, if this can be validated in subsequent studies, a very interesting observation. Another study compared the rela relative efficacy and safety of tofacitinib, baracitinib, upadacitinib, and the available data on frigotinib in comparison to adalimumab in patients with active rheumatoid arthritis. And in patients who did not adequately respond to methotrexate suffering from RA, Baracitinib 4 mg in combination with methotrexate and upadacitinib, the 15 mg dose in combination with methotrexate, showed the highest response rates. Uh, 
That's also quite interesting putting this into context and maybe this is something also taking into consideration uh, into clinical practice in co combination with the long-term drug adherence or survival rates of these compounds. Another study uh, looked for the predictors for short-term clinical effectiveness, effectiveness of paracetinib in patients with active rheumatoid arthritis in a clinical practice setting. And this is data from the Japanese multicenter registry. And here paracetinib was more effective when used as a first line targeted synthetic DMARD. Uh, careful observation is needed in terms of the potential adverse events, including herpes zoster. Uh, but uh, as a first line treatment, also very consistent with our experiences, uh, paracetinib is a very valuable track and again giving us the opportunity for a 4 milligram and a 2 milligram dose. Uh, another study uh, looked into the prediction of inadequate response to JAK inhibitors, uh, again in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. This is a cluster analysis. And here, patients who did not adequately respond to JAK inhibition were more likely seronegative rheumatoid arthritis patients, had used methotrexate, and there was an absence of interstitial lung disease and B uh, biological DMARD. And the cl this cluster analysis, I think, is an explore exploratory tool that aids in the analysis of a huge amount of uh, data. Uh, it's one of the, uh, let's say, beginning to understand uh, inadequate response of JAK inhibitors, but I have to confess that these are very, very few patients, and usually if one switches from one JAK inhibitor to another JAK inhibitor, in most of the patients one can really achieve uh, responses. I think it's an interesting approach, but definitely you need more than 120 patients to draw conclusions like this. And for the moment, I think it's interesting to do a prediction, to develop prediction tools, but I think we are not at all there where we want to be. Uh, I absolutely agree with you. I would rather do a JAK inhibitor, switching JAK inhibitor study mm -hmm. in order to identify uh, patients who do not, let's say, uh, adequately respond uh, to the second and third, third JAK inhibitor. Uh, that because uh, after the third JAK inhibitor, I have no experiences that how many patients and, and, and what type of patients uh, those are. But by the way, I have the experience that I switched from one to another available, already available JAK inhibitor, um, that I achieved responses. And yeah. uh, I didn't believe that before because uh, it, it's not really very clear, understandable. Uh, but I saw this clinically, um, despite my prejudice, and I did it, and I saw good results. I, I, so maybe, I, maybe I was not clear enough. I, I meant that after, there is very often a response if you switch from one JAK inhibitor to another, and even very few ones if you put them on the third one. I, I, I don't know if and how many patients would not respond to a third the JAK inhibitor because they have already been cycled through so many other therapies. There is one abstract uh, by David Eisenberg on the Bruton tyrosine kinase, uh, phenebrotinib, um, studied in lupus. Lupus will be the new field and this is your working area. Uh, I'm very uh, much interested in uh, your impression on these data. So this is a new kit, the Phenebrutinib. Uh, it is not that one, uh, the Brutons kinase, I think, which is produced by Roche. Correct me if I'm wrong. At least we can see by these data, the safety profile was acceptable. There were um, also the responder index measured um, compared to placebo, and there was at least seen somehow a treatment effect. There was another um, interesting trial um, also presented by you, Thomas, um, 
the phase two data from the lupus trial with Bari 4 milligram. And what was shown here by these data is that uh, this dosage already in this phase two trial, and we are now running the phase three trial, that many um, pro-inflammatory cytokines um, were impacted and that we can deduce from this reduction, they have they play a bigger role in the pathogenesis of lupus than we had thought before. So I think I have really shown it in the right way. Um, and especially what you told me already, that interferon alpha and gamma were not reduced with the Bari treatment. I think that is also a impor very important result of these data. As you mentioned already, it's somehow uh, disappointing that phenobrutinib as a kind of more or less selective B cell, but also monocyte macrophage targeting compound did not really show superiority in the lupus trial, but it was also not so strong uh, as last year presented for rheumatoid arthritis with the exception of the TNF inadequate responding population. Uh, but that's the, the data are as they are. Um, and uh, it's apparently for phenobrutinib in systemic lupus really very disappointing. Uh, um, the other point to the paracetinib inhibition in patients with lupus in a phase two trial, it was really very uh, yeah, interesting to see that interferon alpha and interferon gamma did not really substantially reduce along with clinical improvements, but it was IL-6 and the P40 chain of IL-1223 that showed yes. this correlation with clinical improvements. And this will be further validated now, hopefully in phase three, which is ongoing. The variety of abstracts included here highlight the ever increasing range of data available on cytokine signaling at this year's Congress. The virtual nature of this year's Congress is new and strange. The CSF have embraced the change and provided our most extensive coverage to date. If you would like to find out more of our EULA coverage, which includes daily highlights and also author abstract presentations, please visit cytokinesignaling.com. Thank you very much for your kind attention uh, from my side and I think also from my colleague Thomas Dörner. Thank <laughs> you.